chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh, and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with Nick. Hi, everyone. Super excited to have Anne Leffen with us today. Anne is an early stage startup problem solver and marketing strategist from Thin Marketing. And she's got quite a varied background. Marketing, tech, finance, fintech, animal health, and I'm <laughs> sure quite a few a few other industries. So to, it should, we should have quite a, a broad range of subjects we can chat about today. So first of all, and one of the questions I ask always is, where on earth are you at the moment? <laughs> I am currently in Connecticut on the east coast of the U.S., so that's where I am. Okay, Connecticut. We haven't had anyone from there yet, so I'd be interested to see uh, the quality of the marketers coming out of out of <laughs> Connecticut. <laughs> Hopefully we pass your test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So why don't we start a little bit about your background, education, how you got in your how you started your own business and some of the exciting yeah. we can we can get into that later. But first let's get into who are you? Who am I? Oh boy, that's a, a broad question. <laughs> Currently, yeah, so I, I run Fin Marketing Management. Uh, I started that in 2020 because of the pandemic, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time kind of thing, still is a good idea. But I have about 20 years of marketing experience. I started in market research. And then to your earlier point, my career has definitely been varied. After market research, I went over to financial services, which was quite a leap and a change from where I was, very different industry, but it was a great leap to make because it opened so many doors for me down the line. Mm -hmm. And I actually flip-flopped a bit between market research and finance mm -hmm. for a while until I landed at mm -hmm. a financial services startup. Mm -hmm. And that was where totally mm -hmm. got bitten by the bug for startups, which I'm sure we will talk more about later, and ran the marketing department and decided this is what I wanted to do. And so here I am. So it's it's quite interesting because from market research into marketing, into startups, into running your own business, those are multiple jobs yeah. in a span of 20 years. So you've had yep. to recalibrate, relearn, and go into completely new industries, which is quite stressful, but quite enjoyable as well as you learn the ropes in yeah. each of those sectors. Yep. I want to go back a little bit into your education. You've got yep. a BA. And I want to talk about your uh, MS in interactive media from Quinnipiac. And the yeah. reason for this is I was talking to my class this morning and I told them when I started studying, there was no Instagram, there was no, there weren't smartphones, there weren't any of these cool things. And what we learned then compared to what students are learning now is, is chalk and cheese. And in 20 years, the next generation is going to have AI built into their course and there's going to be something yep. weird and wonderful that they have to have. So I want to talk about what you learned at Quinnipiac, but you know? what has stayed the same and what has completely just disappeared out uh, with the bathwater. Oh, so I'm going to really age myself here. But so interactive um, media is kind of lends itself to the name here, right? We learned how to shoot video and edit video, edit audio. We got started in app design. We learned how to write for the web. We kind of learned about <laughs> ethics on the web, things like that. It was a very interesting degree, and I'm glad that I got it, with very kind of like it was a balance of technical skills and philosophical skills. So very interesting. But to your point, I mean, when we were shooting video, we had actual like film in, in the camera. I mean... I think about that now, how ridiculous that sounds. It sounds ridiculous to me. Everything would be digital, right? I'm not even sure the class would be completely different. And even just the, the designing apps, the Photoshop skills, all those things, all of that now. I mean, to your point, AI would be huge. It would replace, I, I don't mean to scare anyone here, but the way we would go about doing those things would be so different. It was very hands-on at the time. And actually, again, aging myself a bit here, but I took a while to complete my MS. Um, I had kids, but I had, like life happened, you know? And even during the course of when I started my MS to when I finished, the degree changed, the courses offered were, were different. And I can only imagine really what that looks like now. It would be, I think it would be completely different. <laughs> well, my course from last year has changed 
obviously, because of ChatGPT. And yeah. we've had to integrate that into our learning and it's changing the way the students work. But I think mm-hmm. it just shows that we are in the era of sort of continuous learning. And I told my class again this morning that this is your life now. You are going to be doing certificates for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's never it's never going to end. But hopefully it might slow down mm-hmm. in a while because I'm sure yeah. we can't come up with too many, too many new things. Oh. Now... I uh, also started out in market research across Africa, doing lots of big youth surveys and that, and also worked a lot with financial services companies because they yeah. understood the value of market research and they understood the importance of both qualitative and quantitative market research in terms of it's an industry which has such a lot of competition because you're essentially selling the same thing. One home yeah. loan versus another home loan. I mean, how many different colors can you do a high net worth individual credit card in and to what more value can you add? So uh, th- that was one of my challenges. But I want to talk a little bit about your starting off in a startup. So you worked in a variety of industries. Taking the leap into a startup is, qu- is, is quite a challenge. Talk yeah. me through how it started. Where did, how did that happen? How did they manage to seduce you to join a six man startup. Yeah. I remember I had a conversation with my husband and my dad actually before I <laughs> took the leap, right? Which seems fair. <laughs> Talking about, you know, what happens if this doesn't work, right? Like, I mean, that's a that's a real thing. A lot of startups fail. And but I have always been a bit of an adrenaline junkie, truthfully. I was a diver in college, I was a gymnast, right? <laughs> so that kind of thing, like a little bit of an edge to it is it was exciting to me. And in this case, the thing that appealed to me most was the idea of building my own department and building a brand from scratch. I mean, that's like, oh, I feel like for a marketer, the chance to build from the ground up is just that was the seduction right there. And I had never, you know, never worked for a startup, didn't know what I was getting myself into for sure. And I remember I showed up the first day and there's, you know, six of us in an old IT closet working and I knew where we were. I wasn't like it was a shock, but it was so different coming from like I had my own <laughs> private office before and it, this has changed, but I loved it. I just loved it because every, a win was everybody's win. A loss was everybody's loss, but the movement was so fast. You know, when they say it's fast paced, I, it, it was fast paced. Change happened quickly. And I loved that. It wasn't red tape. It wasn't waiting around. If something didn't work, you tried something else. You didn't have to, you know, you want to go get permission, you literally roll your chair over <laughs> down, like, and you ask for it or not. And it, it was great. So it, it wasn't a risk. Yes, it was a calculated risk. I did my homework, had the conversations, you know, looked at my own finances in the background to see what would happen if, you know, if this failed kind of thing. And, and I'm so glad that I made that leap. It was, it was a great decision. <laughs> Now, building a marketing team from scratch, from scratch, that's quite an important phase in the business life because if you're a market, marketing or brand-driven business, you are the engine room, basically, of that business. You, If you're creating the brand, you are creating the positioning, how you treat suppliers, customers. It's not just the marketing messages that go out. It also goes into HR what type of people are going to represent our brand. So from that perspective, you are quite an integral part of the future success of that building, right. uh, of, that, of that business. Yeah. When you were building up your team, as you said, you had a, an office before, you probably had lots of research reports, you had all of the subscriptions to technology and that. Your first couple of weeks when you actually, when it dawned on you that, wait a minute, I've got to do everything, Obviously, there's excitement, but what else? Overwhelm, for sure. And wrapping my head around, you know, where are we really at? What do I really have? You know, so it's kind of, I hate to use the term audit, but it's probably the best way to describe this here, or just an assessment of what, yeah, what do I have? What tools do I have? What channels are we currently using? Where are their gaps, right? And then what are the goals? Actually, those two things might be flip-flopped there, but where are we trying to go? And then what do I need to actually get to those goals? It was definitely a frenzy 
you know, because there's a little bit of you need to keep the lights on while you're also doing this type of work. And I feel like that's probably the best way to describe startups in general is you, I, I always and still kind of feel like you, you need to keep the lights on and get the work done while you're also doing these other assessments. Of how are we doing? So it's a little bit of a balancing act most of the time. And that's how it was. It was a, a bit of chaos for sure. When you're in a large organization, there's quite a lot of wastage in marketing. So you can do extra market research. You can buy mm -hmm. all sorts of reports that never actually get read. You give the advertising agency a little bit of leeway on things. Talk to me about f focus in marketing spend and marketing activities in a startup because you've got finite resources, finite time. And as you said, you've got to keep the lights running. You can't always be strategic and create the best plan. No. And so I think especially in the early days, right, there's a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks, right? But when you do that, you have to be willing to say to pull the plug and be like, it didn't stick. Or yes, this definitely stuck. Now, how do we, you know, like light it on fire or blow it up kind of thing. So that being flexible and also I, rem I remember my boss saying, you know, just if we're not making mistakes then we're not trying hard enough, you know, if we're not failing at something, we're not trying hard enough, which can be unpalatable sometimes to feel like, why isn't this working or why isn't this working? But you have to try a variety of things. And when your budget is small, you have to get creative with how you try them too. you know, getting back to basics of making sure things like content and SEO and things that are organic and can be, a very inexpensive way to grow a brand, albeit maybe slowly, make sure those things are buttoned up so that you can, with the budget you have, you can hopefully really narrow down what's working. I'm going to go into one last point just on this on this startup, sure. and that is the, the point of positioning or focus. Mm -hmm. Again, large organizations can sort of sometimes do a bit of a shotgun approach because they've got much larger, larger audience. They've got a bit of runway because they've got clients behind them and, and money behind them. Mm -hmm. When you're a startup and your idea isn't fully baked in yet, what challenges uh, and maybe in that first company, how did you overcome something like that? How do you convince the leadership that we need to get this positioning right? You might have a great product, but... You know, and we did that, actually. So they had a positioning statement that was out in the universe. And it was a bit of a, a combination of like, hey, like, this is good enough. But we don't think it's great. Thankfully, leadership agreed that when I when I, that conversation came up, that it was all time to sit down and take a look at it. I am a big fan of the start with why I'm a cynic. And so the entire team all, you know, six of us sat down and we, we and we hashed that out right we just we went through the why the who the what and we just started from scratch and then to your point i mean you know there wasn't a budget for market research so the market research had to occur with current customers out at conferences during social i mean we really relied heavily on the sales team to try the messaging on the phone so it was that's how we tested it and and got a good response. And then we tweaked as necessary, you know, but that that's how I approached it. That's how the company approached it. Awesome. Now, you left that startup, I take yes. it, and started yes. your and started your own business. So yes. you'd um, got a little bit of wind under your wings and you'd experienced and you've seen, wait a minute, I can do this. So yep. what what motivated you though to not go to another startup or larger business, but to help other startups? So Somewhere along the way, I realized, well, actually, I shouldn't, let me backtrack myself a little bit here. So my dad ran a small business right, and for most of his career. And I remember thinking to myself, someday I would love to run a business. And that's as far as the statement got. I had no idea what I wanted to do, right? Just I would love to, to work for myself. And when I started with startups, I just, I loved the environment, right? We've gone over that. And I think at that point in my career, I got to this place of it's time, right? I want to make my own dream come alive. I love helping others, but I also want this to be fulfilling for myself. And so I started to think about what is it that I really want to do? What matters to me? And a large part of that was circling around how do I help other people? For me, marketing hasn't always felt very noble 
or like, how am I actually helping the world with marketing? And that bothered me. But when I started to look at the work that startups do, that entrepreneurial spirit, it was exciting. And so many of these companies are really trying to make an impact with the products that they're bringing to the world. And that felt noble and that felt helpful. And I wanted to get involved with that. And you know, my first client, and I still have this client now, they provide a mm-hmm. therapy cancer treatment for animals. And I mean, I, I know in Connecticut, we love pets. So we see them as an extension of the family. And I loved the idea of cancer mm-hmm. treatment, working on a startup that's providing cancer treatment seemed very noble. And that was kind of my, that was my jumping off point was working with them and saying like, I can consult for you and figure it out a little bit along the way, which I did and I'm still doing. And yeah, that was, that's how I got started. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting how unrelated experiences or experiences that you potentially in the beginning of your career thought, Ugh, how is this ever going to be useful? Come back and are useful later on. And it comes back to the um, animal health uh, that you potentially worked with uh, early, earlier in your life. Mm-hmm. And now you're working on a startup that's uh, related to animal health. So it, it's yep. this full circle. And I, and I tell that to my students as well. Nothing that you have done from volunteering to working at, as a cashier or looking at, uh, at packing shelves, all of that has some potential value later, yep. on, in your, later on in your career. Yep, 100%. I mean, yeah. this, even I think like I, I'm a, a waitress for a summer and that's a fast paced mm-hmm. job. I'll tell you what, it's good to have that like quick recall. You can apply that to almost anything. So I agree with you. I, all the experiences you have add up to make you who you are in your career. Yeah. So now when we when you're working with startups, obviously they don't have enormous amounts of money typically no. behind them. And the role of brand sort of takes second place to sales. And often it's a sales and marketing manager that is required for these businesses because you need to create the materials and you need to go out and make sure the sales guys are, are, are hitting targets. I want to talk about the importance of customer lifetime value of understanding your customer and your and customer acquisition costs. So I'm not uh-huh. sure whether this is something that you that you focus on with your clients. But for me, I ask people, how much do you want to spend on your marketing? Or how much if you had to spend $500 on getting a client, is that too expensive? And they'll invariably say yes. Then I say, well, wait a minute. Have you actually looked at the customer lifetime value? Do you know how much this customer is going to be worth to you over time? And are you willing to spend $500 for somebody who's going to spend $50,000 over a lifetime with you? How many of those discussions have you had with, with startups or clients? So in full transparency, the conversations will happen, but... The companies that I tend to work with, I feel like more often than not, it's do we still even have the right audience? So I think it's a it's a it's a valid question that has to be brought up because if you're not talking about how much are we spending to get a lead, at some point that comes back to haunt you, right? You have no way, no mechanism to determine is this truly an effective channel for us? And I'm having that experience with a with a current client now where the spend, and I, I mean, truthfully, I've seen this with so many startups. It's, this is the budget, we're just going to spend, and then suddenly the budget gets moved, and no one's really paying attention. Paying attention. And asking the question of, hey, guys, are, are we tracking this? Do we know how many leads came in? Can we actually determine if we spent $10,000 and we got one lead, to your point, is $10,000 per lead, is that an acceptable number? So it may not be happening in a, as sadly as this is to say, potentially very strategic and buttoned up manner, it's happening when the customer, my, my customers realize, hey, we have, a, we have a problem. And so usually that's a phase that I kind of come to them with and say like, it's time to start getting more strategic about how we're spending our dollars and how we're tracking how leads come in and how much it costs to actually get there. So that's probably more how the conversation goes. Yeah. Well, I think the value of folks like yourself and and other consultants in this space is that a lot of startups have tremendous potential, great products, great services, but 
just don't know how to, to get it to market. And I take it quite a lot of your work is getting these guys to market. And I yeah. suppose one of the main aspects of that is the customer journey. And these are base, these are very basic things. I mean, it's not necessarily brain surgery, but your customer journey and your buyer journey are yeah. critical to a business's success. But very often these folks completely neglect that. Let's just go onto Facebook. Let's go onto this. Why aren't we converting? Well, I, <laughs> yes. Well, maybe because your audience isn't there, right? You know, and that and that thought just hasn't happened. And in fairness to in fairness to startups, right? I there is this chaos and speed, I think, at which hap at, at which things happen very early on. And it the those conversations just don't happen. Whether they could have happened or whether they just literally can't because no one is there to have them with or with an expertise to have those conversations with, they don't. And so we're chugging along, chugging along. The company's growing. People are getting out of it and it still hasn't happened. And it's like, oh my God, you just have this marketing mess or mm -hmm. a sales mess and no, again, no real way to track what is the actual journey of our customer and what do they need at each of those points? Again, it's not a new concept. It's not yeah. rocket science, but if it doesn't happen, it, it can really be mm -hmm. detrimental to mm -hmm. the growth of a company. So I want to touch a little bit on fintech startups. Okay. Obviously, it's a cutthroat arena. There's also been crypto. There's all sorts of new financial instruments and different ways that uh, people are moving to Apple Pay, Google Pay. A yeah. lot of legacy businesses are, are really feeling the, feeling the pinch. What are yep. some of the challenges that you see facing fin startups right now and how can you or how are you supporting them in in navigating these changing times you know it's interesting one of the things that i've seen is just two things one is a lot of companies kind of being bought up by a larger parent company so these startups really are no longer independent out on their own they're kind of getting molded into these amalgamations of larger companies so it's this kind of like idea of one-stop shopping, right? I'm, gonna, I'm thinking of financial planning in this instance, right? There used to be a lot of independent players in that space. And suddenly all these large fidelity, all these large companies were kind of like swallowing them all up. And it became easier with the thought being that it became easier for, let's say, financial advisors to mm -hmm. get all of their software under one roof. Mm -hmm. So it makes a ton of sense to get where they're going with that. It's an interesting trend to see happen, happening. The reverse of that is you still have the holdouts that want to be independent. And, I, and there's a space for them, for sure. And I, I up, applaud that, right? And while you aren't seeing them necessarily being swallowed up by the big guys, the big parent, parent company, you do see these kind of interesting partnerships form so that you kind of get the safety of numbers. So there may they are still an independent company, but they have their friends in the sandbox, as I like to say, where they can offer maybe discounts to uh, portfolio management software or something else that is a, something else a financial advisor might need. So that's definitely, those are the, the trends I kind of see there. It's, it's tough, right? It is definitely cutthroat. There's new players coming in all the time and only so many advisors that can, that can, or, you know, whomever the particular audience is to, to use the software. So it's interesting what's happening there. The, the branding landscape has, has changed quite a lot. So when we're talking about startups, brand is obviously one of the things that they, that they need to build up. But what I've seen, and I've had a very interesting discussion with another entrepreneur, the importance of personal brands sure. in startups and businesses. Right now, anyone can create a logo. You can go to Envato. You can go to any number of free websites and download yep. beautiful designs. Really, there'd be... <laughs> They'd be acceptable anywhere. They're, they're quite beautiful and they cost nothing. You can go to Fiverr, you can download things. Yeah. So I think the value of brands is sort of declining a bit because it's, it's very commoditized. What uh -huh. isn't commoditized, however, is building your personal brand. So how important for you when dealing with your startups is building a personal brand in the business? I love this point because I have heard this come up over and over and over again recently, the idea of how important it is for that the founder to really have that startup brand uh, there or buttoned up. Um, and I actually, I just hosted uh, a LinkedIn Live a few weeks ago with a, a fellow colleague who that's, that's all she works on is founder story, founder brand. 
I think from an investor perspective, they want to hear your story. It's right to your point. It's different. It's, it's one of the things that is truly unique and different about your company that no one else can say that that was their story. And I think buyers also want to hear that piece, right? I, I, I really hate the word authentic, mm-hmm. but there is something that I, buyers want to know what it is, what thing it is about you and your company that's special and different. And they attach to that and your story is it. So I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out with my founders, see one, their level of comfort of sharing that story and being kind of that figurehead for the company and, and figuring out appropriate ways to disseminate that so that, you know, the world gets to hear and gets, gets to share. But I think I think that is very important right now. Definitely a hop on item. <laughs> it's a it's a tough balancing act because in yeah. one sense you don't want to be the face of the company and then all the value accrues yeah. to you as the individual. But as you say, on the startup phase, people don't know what your business stands for. They don't they don't know what your logo, your colors. They don't care to be very honest. And the only way to really break through is by having a strong personal brand. Yep. So for those folks who are founders and are not very you know, TV shy or not uh, media savvy, they struggle. So I really think there's a big space there for these folks to start focusing more on interpersonal skills, networking, yeah. building building their profile. And we're going to see more and more of that as you have more and more faceless brands. And it goes back to the fundamentals of branding where a brand is a symbol of trust. You can go back to that person. You can you can associate things with them. You can complain back to a person to a yep. you know, the person who owns owns that brand. Whereas now, on with everything being social media, people not really meeting each other. Yep. At least if there's a personal brand, you can associate a business product, etc all your personality with the personality of, of that founder. Well, Anne, it's been fascinating chatting to you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And it's been very interesting hearing a little bit about your history. We can talk about the gymnastics and the go cubs <laughs> or bears or whatever it is uh, a little bit later. But very interesting hearing your story. And I'm sure the listeners will enjoy it as well. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a true pleasure. Chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh.